Well, welcome. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Rob Ramirez. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces here and a lot of new ones too. How many, uh, how many is this, is, raise your hands if this is your first conference. Wow. Okay. So, well, you, you're in for a treat. Um, you know, the, you know, get to get to know each other. Tonight's reception is going to, going to be great as well. And, uh, you're, you're in for a good two and a half days. Uh, so, so get your brain ready. So, um, welcome back. It's, uh, it's good to be here. So, um, so I am a associate professor of medicine and a medical oncologist at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. Um, I see patients primarily with neuroendocrine tumors and thoracic malignancies. Uh, uh, so, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, neuroendocrine tumors. The lung is, uh, is Dr. Thor had had uh, laid the stage uh, for th for things. You know, it's a, you know, I'll be going through some of the studies, some of the evidence, some of the you know presentations of things. So, um, you know. I think at the end of the day, remember that you know we're you know we're we're all a big family here, and 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 we're here for you. So yeah, I always you know I, I'm not Bob. I'm not sure how we're handling questions, uh, but but if you have questions, feel free to you know chime in, ask uh, you know you know any, any of us uh, you know, and you know all of us are readily accessible by email as well. So so feel free to reach out. All right, so, so neuroendocrine tumors of the lung uh, really represent a, a diverse group of malignancies. Uh, so we call them the pulmonary carcinoid tumors and the neuroendocrine carcinomas, um, and I'll get into a little bit of that. Now, this is a little bit different than, you know, when we think about lung cancer, we say, well, you know, most of lung cancer starts out in, in patients who smoke. Well, not necessarily in the, in the neuroendocrine tumors. Some of the high-grade ones are associated with, uh, with smoking, but, but the pulmonary carcinoid tumors, which what I'll focus on today, are, are not associated with. Sometimes there's a genetic syndrome associated with it, but that tends to be the minority of, of this. Um, and they're really uncommon. So when you look at all neuroendocrine tumors, about a quarter of them actually start out in the lungs, whereas if you look at all lung cancers, only about 2% are pulmonary carcinoid tumors. So, so we break them down into different names. So we, so we categorize them as typical and atypical carcinoid tumors. And then the higher grade ones we call large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and small cell lung cancer. And I put the cigarette there because these are the, the smoking related malignancies. All right, so symptoms. Now, now as you, as you can probably imagine, uh, respiratory symptoms are, are somewhat common with, uh, with the pulmonary carcinoid tumors. So a lot of times we see patients with uh, recurrent pneumonias, um, uh, a lot of cough, uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, coughing up blood, we call hemoptysis. Uh, shortness of breath is, it can happen, wheezing, um, when it gets more advanced, we start getting into the pain. If, uh, if, if this cancer is spread to the bone, this can cause a pain, pain, uh, pain in the bones. Every now and again, we'll get a hormonal syndrome associated with this. It's not common, but, uh, but every now and again, we see this. And what we see a lot is this gets picked up incidentally. So patients with, uh, you know, they come in for, I saw a, a patient the other day who came in with, for, a, for a kidney stone and they did a CT of the abdomen on, on her and picked up, a, picked up a, a, a lung nodule that turned out to be a pulmonary carcinoid tumor. So, so these, things, these things happen. So, so this is, you know, it all sort of starts out with, uh, you know, if you're, you have your symptoms, it all start, sort of starts out with, with imaging. And, it, you know, a lot of times we, we start out with a chest x-ray, which may show some abnormalities, but then we move to a, to a CT of the chest uh, um, uh, and the abdomen to completely stage everything. Uh, so the, so this, is, this is sort of what we're, what we're seeing here. So you see, Here's your here's your lung mass. So so you, you may see a lot of these scans here today. So let me just uh, let me just kind of let you know what we're looking at. This is somebody cut in half. Okay, uh, th this way. So 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 imagine the imagine the head that way and the feet this way, um, and then this is the left side, the right side, the back, and the front. So we've got a tumor in the lungs right there. So 
So, so that's sort of that first step in, uh, in picking this up. Uh, if we think there's metastatic disease, as Dr. Thor had pointed out, the MRI is the best test for the, for the liver. Um, so so we'll, we'll frequently get that. Uh, and then we do something called functional imaging. So, so this is, uh, you may have heard of an Octrea scan. I'll, 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 I'll go on the record as saying if, you're, if you get offered an Octrea scan, please, please decline it and, and say I'd rather have a Dotatate PET CT. Um, that is the, the, the newest technology and, and it, uh, it's far superior to the Octrea scans. Uh, so, so what the Dotatate PETs do is they give us an idea as to the extent of disease. Many of these things, many of these cancers have somatostatin receptors on their surface and, and, the, and the PETs can pick these up. So you can see a PET right here so you can see tumor light up there and up there. So, so, so that is the next step in working this up. So ultimately, somebody's going to say, we need to get a biopsy. And, and, uh, and there's many different ways to, to do it. A, a biopsy, uh, and why do you need it? Well, it gives us a diagnosis, okay? Nobody's gonna tell you you have this unless they look at it underneath the microscope, okay? So, so it gives us a diagnosis, and in many cases, it gives us staging information. Uh, but there's several ways to do it, and I'll, I'll go through some of this. So CT-guided, uh, we do something called a bronchoscopy uh, or an endobronchial ultrasound. There's a surgical biopsy, uh, thoracentesis, pericardiocentesis. And so this is a picture of a CT guided biopsy. So, so you can see that it's, so this is actually, oops. Um, so this is, you see the CT right there, but this is what, this is what the radiologist is seeing. So you see this lung nodule right there. And it's, and it's really, it's really interesting for, for us medical people to, to, who, who don't do this is to actually see this in action. You see right out here is the actual needle. And you can see that needle going right into that tumor and, and getting that biopsy. So that's a, so when they say that we need a CT guided biopsy, this is, this is how it's done. Now bronchoscopy is a little bit different. Um, so bronchoscopy actually uses, they, they put you to sleep and they use a, a scope that goes down into the airway um, and, and can visualize the, the, these tumors. So, um, an endobronchial ultrasound, very similar. We, many times we do these at the same time. So you can see what happens here is you can see, so here's your windpipe here, your, your trachea. You have lymph nodes on, on kind of scattered throughout. And so what this can do is this, this probe can actually, it's an ultrasound probe. So you can actually visualize things on the outside of, of the lumen. And it comes with a, with a handy needle there so that can biopsy those lymph nodes. Uh, so it's very good for getting uh, lymph node biopsies. So this is just a, a short video that I pulled uh, from, from the internet that, that actually looks at, the, looks at what a bronchoscopy does, what we're looking at, so. And I'll just try to walk you through this, so. All right, so you see, you see a CT with a big mass uh, right there. So that's what we're looking for. And then you see on the left side, you see some narrowing of the left upper uh, bronchus. So now we're, you know, so this is the actual going down. So you're going through the vocal cords, going into the, into the trachea. The main carina is where it, where it splits into a left and right. All right. So, so now you see that narrowing right there, and you see that mass. Um, and with that, you can do biopsies and, and, uh, and brushings and, and really get an idea what, uh, what is going on there. So, so that's what the pulmonologist does. And you see a nice clean airway there. So, so that's your that's a bronchoscopy. There's other biopsy techniques. Um, so, so sometimes uh, patients will have um, uh, fluid uh, or a pleural effusion, and so so that 
fluid can be can be drained so you can see a needle going into there and it, and every now and again we can't we we can't get a diagnosis based off of a needle biopsy or a bronchoscopy so sometimes we do an open biopsy so you can you can see this right here where there are it's a surgical biopsy so so we do the biopsy we send it to the pathologist and we say all right well what is this okay so so what they're what the pathologist is looking for when you know one they're looking for to tell us what this is now many times uh, I'll get a report that says neuroendocrine tumor or neuroendocrine carcinoma and that's sort of you know it doesn't really tell me a whole lot you know there's a lot of different variations between all of this so so sometimes I'll have to you know call the pathologist and say I, I need I need a, a, a better idea what we're de what we're dealing with. So I so again I um, what we look for is something called the mitotic index and to determine between the uh, between the different neuroendocrine tumors of the lung. So mitotic index in presence or absence of necrosis that sort of defines the typical and atypical. When we look at the higher grade ones. We look at lots and lots of mitosis. They look much, much different than, uh, so this, this tumor looks much, much different than this one. So, um, and again, that's the least aggressive to the most aggressive there. So, so these are all things that we, that we look for uh, on our pathology reports. Now, I'm sure somebody will talk about classification uh, in the coming talks. There's, there's, uh, the lung neuroendocrine tumors are classified different than the uh, than the GI and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors. So there's something called the KI67, which is included in in that category, but not necessarily in the in the lung neuroendocrine tumors. We think it's probably useful, but we just don't have enough data to support putting that into the classification for everybody. So, so staging. Um, this is a very simple. Uh, uh, outline of staging. Essentially, stage one is confined to a, a single location. A stage two is when uh, that tumor has spread to, to that first set of lymph nodes. Um, stage three is when that tumor is probably a little bit bigger and is spread to the, the lymph nodes in the middle of the chest. And then stage four is when this has uh, gone beyond the, beyond the lung or to the, to the opposite lung. And that all of this will help guide treatment. Now, the biggest thing, is, and you'll hear this again and again at this meeting, is it's important to choose the right treatment at the right time. You know, everybody, you know, um, you know, we'll we'll talk about this multidisciplinary approach that we use, and it really does take a team of specialists to to say, all right, well, this is what we're going to do for this patient today. Um, which may be totally different than someone with a similar presentation um, uh, uh, because of various factors. So, so this is your team. So, so, so my team is uh, is the our oncology colleagues or pathologists, the thoracic surgeons, pulmonary, um, interve interventional radiology. So, so there's a lot of people who are who are looking at this and really determining what the what the best options for treatment are. So, I really do think that multidisciplinary setting is is the best way to uh, approach this. So, for instance, the, so you see, these patients have the same diagnosis. Okay, so you see this, you see that tumor. Uh, it's the, it's the same. They're both atypical carcinoid tumors of the lung, but they're going to be treated vastly different. Uh, you may see, you see, see the presence of a bone metastasis there. So, so, so that's when the you know the goals change. So, so you may have the same diagnosis, but much different treatment. So, so what do we think about when when we're thinking about treatment? So, so stage. Do you have symptoms? Um, is there somatostatin receptors on your tumor that we can visualize on the pet how big is it how, you know how is it is it a single lung nodule or is, or do we have multiple nodules uh in liver metastasis what are the what other medical problems are there and then obviously you know all of this is discussed with our patients and and we make a a, a joint decision so so generally the you know the treatment uh for early stage pulmonary carcinoid tumors is surgery uh, so we we will typically perform a lobectomy uh, or sometimes a, something called a segment uh, or segmentectomy uh, with 
with sampling of the lymph nodes. Uh, there's growing literature that supports the use of high dose radiation for for uh, these tumors, and then adjuvant treatment. So this is chemotherapy or treatment after a potential curative intent surgery. That's somewhat that's somewhat controversial, um, and we'll. We'll talk about that. Uh, so these are the types of lung resections. So wedge resection is simply that they take a little piece of the piece of the lung, uh, a wedge, of that. We don't really we try to avoid that because it um, high, higher rate of recurrence with with something like that. So more and more, what we're doing is the segmentectomy. So so the lungs are divided into lobes, and within the lobes are segments. So we do we can take out that entire segment with with sampling of the lymph nodes. The lobectomy is taking the entire lobe, and then a pneumonectomy is taking that entire lung. So adjuvant treatment. So, so in a patient with, you know, I see a lot of patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Now that, that data is pretty clear. If a patient comes in with a non-small cell lung cancer and they have node, they have uh, lymph node metastasis, and that patient's going, to the oncologist and getting adjuvant chemo. And, and nowadays we actually do neo, uh, neoadjuvant or, or chemo before treatment. Um, but in this disease, the, the data just doesn't, we don't have a large study that says that, says that this does any benefit uh, for patients. Uh, in fact, uh, um, Dr. Thor's group actually looked at this in a large series and said, you know what, it's, this may actually harm patients if we do adjuvant therapy. So, so if you look at, you know, you know, if you look at different guidelines, so ENETS and NCCN and ESMO, some of that, you know, they, they actually recommend adjuvant treatment um, in, in patients. But if you look at the actual manuscript of the guidelines, they say there's no data to really support the use of it. I think it sort of make, makes people feel better, you know, to say they're doing something. So what we did a few years ago is we looked at all the, we, we, through the Comnets and Nanets, we came up with our own guidelines, uh, and we said there's no evidence for adjuvant, the benefit for adjuvant uh, treatment. So, so that's, what, that's what we tend to do. So, so endobronchial tumors. So this is something uh, something we'll see uh, every now and again. So, so so this is this is a CT, uh, and you're sliced in half this way. So so you can see the left lung and the right lung. So the airway comes down here, but you've got a golf ball that's sitting right there. Okay, and you, as you can imagine. This can cause a lot of problems with uh, shortness of breath, or, or it can bleed, uh, wheezing, cough, strider, um, if it's if it's severe and respiratory distress. Uh, and many times, you, 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 patients will will uh, get diagnosed with with asthma or COPD or, or pneumonia. Um, so so there's different things that we can do for this. Um, so so. This is all called endobronchial therapy. So this is a little bit different than surgical resection. So, so there's different types of endobronchial therapy. So there's a, a cryotherapy or freezing it, thermal therapy, heating it, laser, photodynamic therapy using light, um, but can provide definitive treatment for this in the right patient uh, in near immediate symptom control. Um, so. If we need to, this doesn't mean that we can't go back and, and do an operation on patients, but maybe they don't need it. Uh, but it's something that will surveil over time. So you can see in that in this first picture here, we see that that endobronchial obstruction there. So so we performed a cryotherapy on this patient, uh, and this is what it looks like at the end. Now you go back at six weeks. All right, you see much different much different uh, pattern here. So you still may see some residual disease here, you know, and then this was treated again, and here we are at eight months, and you can see total resolution of this, and this is a patient who did not need to undergo a surgical resection. But again, this is somebody who's gonna be followed for, for many years. So this is that same patient, so this is before and after. All right, so what are some of the non-surgical options for advanced disease? So, so I'll, I'll, there's, there's, there's many different options that, that, we, can, that we can entertain. Uh, so, so one, 
observation. Now, now, someone says, well, why in the world would, you know, if I have a cancer, why in the world would I observe this? Why would I not do something about it? Well, in someone with advanced disease, multiple pulmonary nodules, if they come in and this, and I have a diagnosis of a typical carcinoid tumor, um, patient is asymptomatic with not much in the way of disease, maybe, maybe several pulmonary nodules. And I can look back and say, you know what, you had a CT done three years ago and these things haven't changed at all. I don't have really good, a really good rationale to say, you know, let's, let's go ahead and get you started on some treatment. I only have so many treatments, uh, you know, and I don't know, you know, I don't want to burn bridges too early. So, so sometimes we'll say, all right, let's just watch this. We'll get a CT, you know, we'll follow you. You're in the system now. We're going to follow you, you know, every few months and, and see what this does. If they start growing or new things start popping up, we've got plenty of treatment. Well, not plenty, but we've got, we've got treatment. So um, you'll hear about the somatostatin analogs. Um, so, so we have two of them in the United States, the octreotide LAR and lanreotide. Um, these, were, these are, are drugs that slow the growth of tumors and help with uh, the carcinoid syndrome. Um, now, these are the two studies that show benefit in patients, but I'll caution that these were done in mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors and also GEPNETs or gastroenteral pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. They're very good. We use them all the time. And, uh, what about lung? Now, now the largest study to prospective study to date was a study called SPINET where they took patients with advanced lung carcinoid tumors and, and random uh, put, put two thirds of them on lanreotide and then a third of them on placebo and said, all right, well, what is, you know, is there any benefit to this? Uh, the study was stopped early uh, because it didn't accrue. Again, these are these are this was a, a worldwide study, but um, but they wanted 215 patients, and after about four years or five years or so, they they were up to 77 patients, and they said this is just going to take too long to accrue. We're not going to accrue everything, but but the data was presented last year at at Nanets, and did show that that patients did seem to benefit um, uh, with, with, uh, this, with this uh, therapy. So more so in the patients with typical carcinoid uh, tumors. So, so we'll, tend to, we'll tend to start out, this is sort of our starting point with, uh, with the typical carcinoid tumors. So, um, so that's one of the tools that we have. Um, what about beyond that? So, so there, is, there are the mTOR inhibitors, this is or everolimus, this is a medication that that uh, inhibits a certain pathway that these cancers use to grow. So this is actually the only FDA approved therapy for lung nets. So I'll talk about these other things, but they're you know when you look at the when you look at the package insert, this will say this will say lung nets. So so it's a it's a oral medication, um, and this trial looked at patients uh, with lung nets and also GI nets uh, and randomized them against placebo, and they did better. Um, so, so, and I've had, it's generally pretty well tolerated to have patients on, on this medication for years at a time, but, but again, this is also one of these tools that, that we use. Now, you'll hear a lot about uh, PRRT, or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Um, this is a really exciting therapy and has really changed the way we, we uh, practice. Um, so this was FDA approved in 2018 off of this trial called the Netter one that looked at patients with metastatic uh, mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors, grade one or two, uh, and then randomized them to either um, the lutetium dotatate um, or high dose octreotide LAR. Now, again, these were patients who were progressing on octreotide LAR already. Um, at the end of the day, the, the PRRT was much better um, as far as progression free survival goes. But, oops. But again, these were in mid gut tumors. Now, now we do have some data in lung nets. We actually have, have quite a few 
retrospective studies that actually look at, at lung nets. Um, and you can see the response rates are, are in that 30 Thirty percent range in many cases. That means that the tumor is actually shrinking. Um, and then when we look at at median overall survivals, you can see there there uh, uh, in most cases over fifty months. Um, so so again, it doesn't mean that you know this is that's that's the 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 time you have. It just means well that's that's just what they did in this trial. So we use it. So um, how do we choose between PRRT and Everlime as well. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, there's a trial that it just opened up at our center uh, that is actually looking to answer this question, randomizing patients to either the PRRT or Everlimus, and we're going to figure out at the end of the day which one we should be using first. Um, what about immunotherapy? So, so you hear a lot on uh, uh, yeah, a lot about Im immunotherapy uh, for many different types of cancers. Uh, in the neuroendocrine world, it's largely been disappointing. Uh, um, I'll talk about a couple studies. So, the Keynote 028 looked at a. a it was uh, a study that used uh, a drug called pembrolizumab, uh, or if you watch TV and you see all the commercials, you may recognize the name Keytruda. Um, so in this study, they uh, uh, looked at carcinoid or pancreatic nets, and the overall response rate was only about 12%, so with a, with a progression-free survival less than six months. So that's not something that's, that's really, you know, that we really think that uh, is beneficial. Um, there was another trial called, um, uh, that used a drug called spartalizumab um, in, in neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas, um, which again, very low response rates. We said, all right, well, you know, this, you know, 7.4% uh, response rate in the neuroendocrine tumor, but in the lung tumors, almost 17% response rate. So maybe, maybe the lungs differ a little bit than the, than the, than the other neuroendocrine tumors. Um, Another trial um, used uh, used a combination of immunotherapies, it, so ipilimumab and nivolumab, or again for the TV watchers, Optivo. Um, so this was in rare tumors, and in the net cohort had 29 patients, and 11 of those were lung. Uh, and in the so the overall response rate was was about 24 percent, but in the lungs it was higher; it was 33 percent. So so this is a combination of treatment I, that I'll use periodically for for patients. Uh, and it and and I've seen some some very nice responses actually in in several patients. This is something called a waterfall plot. So so this is this is uh, this is the starting point. So everything above the line, everything above this line, is growth of disease. Everything below the line is shrinkage. So the two complete responders here were were the lung were were lungs. So. So maybe there's something to it. I think we need more research. So there's chemotherapy, um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about this combination, capecitabine and temozolomide. Um, this is an oral regimen that, uh, that does show some benefit. Um, um, uh, the group from Moffitt uh, published this a few years ago that, uh, that looked at all of their lung net patients and, and showed that uh, it has about a 30% response rate with, with a stable disease rate of 55% and an overall disease control rate of 85%. So again, this is something that, uh, that is one of those tools that we have. Um, so I'm going to shift gears right now uh, and talk about something called Diffuse idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, or DIPNEC. Um, so what we think, so DIPNEC is a rare disease. So the largest uh, case series was actually um, uh, Dr. Thor's that looked at uh, uh, 59 patients that had come through Mayo. It took them 19 years to get these 59 patients. So so that's how that's how uncommon this is. Or not easily recognized, I guess, uh, is is uh, is what we probably think. Uh, and what this is is it's a uh, proliferation of the neuroendocrine cells. Um, it tends to affect women at the fifth to fifth to sixth decade. Uh, and what we think is it's it could be a pre neoplastic condition. So so dip neck may evolve into carcinoid tumors. That's not a hundred percent. 
There's patients with carcinoid tumors that don't have dipneck. There's patients with dipneck that don't have carcinoid tumors, but uh, but there's some that have both. So, but I think it's certainly an under-recognized uh, uh, condition. So, so this was initially coined in 1992. Um, and this was the original report of this. So again, it's a relatively newly described entity. And this paper describes six patients, and they all had cough and uh, dis uh, shortness of breath and, uh, and characteristic findings on their imaging. Um, some got chemo and didn't improve. Uh, uh, some of this progressed, uh, and this can be a really debilitating condition. So, so the symptoms are really nonspecific for this. Um, cough and shortness of breath, those are sort of the big ones. Uh, and it can go undiagnosed for years and years. Um, and uh, it's often confused with COPD or asthma. Um, on, the, on the CT or x-rays, you see pulmonary nodules. Um, uh, and then there's certain, there's certain other characteristics that we look for on the, on the x-rays or on the CT. Um, you diagnose it by looking at it underneath the microscope. And generally, you need to have a, a, a good piece of tissue. So this would be a surgical biopsy. Um, I won't go too much into the pulmonary function testing. So, it, because it's it's sort of it's sort of a, uh, all over the place. So some people have different types of uh, of uh, of issues with their pulmonary function, um, including normal. So um, this is a this is a CT uh, of a patient with with dip neck. Okay, so we're scrolling through the lungs, and so what you see here, you see all the the um, see how some areas are are blacker than others in the lungs. We can, we can play that again if, if we can. Uh, that's something called mosaic attenuation. So these, these, uh, so this disease will, will clamp off small airways or obstruct them. And so this is the characteristic finding. So when we look at that, we say, well, you know, that's very classic for, for a patient with dip neck. And intermixed with their in there is multiple nodules. Uh, this is a patient. This is a patient with uh, with dip neck and multiple carcinoid tumors. So you can see one there and there. Um, this is this is an interesting patient with uh, with unilateral dip neck. So so you can see multiple nodules on this side, and then this side is, is has no nodules. So I don't I can't explain that, but. Uh, but there's one other case in the literature that I'd seen. So, um, so this was uh, a, one study that looked at uh, a group of 18 patients, and and really what I want to point out to this is is the the duration of illness prior to diagnosis was almost nine years. So, um, and and we see this, and in that original in that original paper from 1992, some of these patients were 20 years with symptoms before a diagnosis. And even in 92, they didn't know what it was. So um, here's that largest case series uh, that, that looked at this. So the majority of patients have those bilateral nodules with this mosaic attenuation. And many of those patients have, have uh, gone through the inhalers and steroids and, and, and the, the somatostatin analogs as well. So um, they found that... Uh, that about 18% of these patients did progress to a carcinoid tumor, uh, um, but but again, it's 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 sometimes the minority of patients. This this is a uh, this is a, uh, a another study that looked at patients with dip neck. So 33 patients with dip neck, but there was also patients with what we call secondary neck. So so everything that is called neuroendocrine hyperplasia is not dip neck. So secondary Hyperplasia can happen because of lung injury, high altitude, the, these kind of things. So chronic, chronic uh, uh, low oxygen levels. Uh, so, so we see this sometimes even in 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 my in my non-small cell cancer patients who who are smokers, and so we do a biopsy and we see this this neuroendocrine hyperplasia. So. Um, 
The way we usually treat this when we see this and it's symptomatic is we use the somatostatin analogs. Um, so, so this is just a series of several different studies that looked at the use of somatostatin analogs. Uh, and you can see symptomatic improvement in, in many of these patients with uh, somatostatin analogs. And what I do is I'll normally put people on a trial of this when, when, when indicated uh, for about three months uh, and see if those symptoms improve. Um, and when they come back, you know, a, a lot of times they say, oh, my cough is gone or it's so, it's so much better. Um, or sometimes they come back and say, yeah, I don't really notice much of a difference. And then the, and then the husband is there saying, yeah, she's coughing way less than she used to. Uh, but we can also measure this objectively with those pulmonary function tests. In many cases, we'll see improvement uh, in that. But like anything, more research is, is needed. Uh, this was a, this was a uh, abstract that we presented at Nanets this year that actually was very simple. We said, all right, what, what is going on in the research community um, in, in the pulmonary carcinoid tumors? And so we said, all right, we're gonna look at two major meetings. We're gonna look at Nanets and we're gonna look at the World Conference on Lung Cancer. So these are, these are major international meetings, right? Because you know, your research is presented at meetings first. And so what we, what we saw was there was about 900 abstracts presented at the Nanets meeting uh, total. So that's this. When we looked at lung, how many of those included lungs? About 20% included lungs. Okay, so so that's still less than what what we what we would hope. When we looked at the World Lung Meeting, so about 17,000 uh, abstracts presented over over the course of several years. This was about 0.7%. And what are the what are these abstracts really telling us? Okay, sometimes we we break them into. Uh, Preclinical, so this is laboratory research. Um, um, so about 18% were at, at both Nanets and World Lung. Clinical landscapes were by far the, the greatest. So this is, oh, I've got a series of neuroendocrine patients and this is what we did with them. So, so it, it helps us out a little bit, but really what we need to advance the fields are the, are the clinical trials. So, so about 35% of the abstracts at Nanets um, that, in, that included this were, were um, uh, lungs were, uh, were uh, so clinical trials were versus at world lung only about 5%. So, and when we looked at primary pulmonary carcinoid clinical trials, there were a total of five. So, so we need we need more research into this. Um, so, stay tuned; it's coming. So, um, this is hard to see, but this is going to be published soon. Uh, this is just sort of my algorithm of going through this. Um, so, again, and I sort of talked about this: a CT, going to a biopsy, going to a pathology. If we think there's a syndrome associated with it, we get hormone levels, whether it's a ACTH or a 5-HIA or, or whatever we think the syndrome may be associated with. Dotate scan, and then we talk about it in the multidisciplinary setting. If it's localized and it's endobronchial, maybe we can do that endobronchial therapy. Um, if there's lymph node involvement or we don't think endobronchial therapy is, is gonna be useful, well, you know, we can, we can take it out. If it's advanced, we've got several different options. So, and then we follow people. If it's if it's localized, we'll follow for at least ten years. Um, if it's uh, if it's advanced, you're not going to get out of our. You're you're going to be seeing us from here on out. So, um, so so I'll just you know I'll wrap up by saying that these are uncommon diseases. They do require this multidisciplinary approach. I talked about surgery being that main stay of treatment, uh, but endobronchial therapy is is certainly, you know, we're getting more and more literature stating, uh, touting the benefits of this. Um, there's only one FDA approved treatment, but we've got a lot of different options that we can do, uh, and they are they they are still poorly understood and require more research. 
So, so I'll stop there. Um, and my, there's my email. Feel free to you know send me a message or uh, or grab me out here and uh, and uh, and uh, enjoy your enjoy your weekend.